go over there, Chris. Go talk to him. Brother, if I do anything more than I've already done, we're going to fight. Tempers were running hot on pit road with issues between the 11 and the 17. But how far up pit road was the problem? We'll explain next. Welcome into a new episode of NASCAR's Inside the Race, presented by Consumer Cellular. I'm Larry McReynolds, filling in for Steve Letarte, Championship Crew Chief Todd Gordon. Todd, before we dive into the actual Coca-Cola 600, how about if we talk about a, a guy that never actually turned a lap in the 600, but Kyle Larson was a big story over the weekend. A huge story, and a great story for motorsports. I think, uh, you know, trying to do the double, the performance he had at Indianapolis, qualifying in the second row, uh, what fifth I think yeah. there and um, you know a great story coming forward I think puts NASCAR in a little funny position um, because we say that all of our drivers have to attempt or have to race all the races but I gotta believe that NASCAR gives a, a waiver here for this situation given the storyline and what's come about personally I'm glad Kyle Larson stayed up there I know we don't live in a what-if world but what if mm -hmm. when the line in the sand happens up there and he leaves and comes back to Charlotte and the weather we actually got about 9.30, actually came about 6.30, so he leaves Indy and the race is rained out in Charlotte. I personally, I'm, I'm cause I, not only was it good for, for NASCAR, not only was it good for, for IndyCar, it was just good for motorsports across the board. Yeah, I think it is. And you see, uh, you see it in all the conversations from the IndyCar drivers talking about him being there and what's going on. Um, really interesting. 18th place finish, not what he wanted. He was pretty down on himself for a speeding penalty, yeah. but uh, um, that's a learning curve. And with this being a two-year process, I think getting those laps and that opportunity sets him up in a better position for 2025. I don't think this will be the last time we see him up there <laughs> running at Indy, but we did have the Coke 600. And, you know, for a number of weeks, we'd kind of been asking, where is that 20 car and Christopher Bell? They won Phoenix and then they kind of fell off the map. Actually, good thing they had that win because they had fallen below the cut line as far as the playoff points. But C. Bell and Adam Stevens, that 20, they pretty much were on it Sunday night. We saw the performance out of this group that we've expected out of them. And, and this is a team that has been a championship four participant the last two years. They've, they've come forward when they had it to, and they put a performance together from Saturday on. And that's one of those things I feel like qualifying on Saturday, top five starting yes. position. And really, if you look at their, let's pull their line graph up for the day. But as you look at this, the only time that they're outside the top 10 is because their pit stop on yeah, the pit, yeah. pit selection on pit road was before the start finish line. Those little dips down there, they really don't mean anything. Solid top 10 car all day long. If you look at pit road, worst stop being a 10.4 second stop. Yeah, it's got to the point though, Todd, you see the same thing I see. With where we're at now with this Gen 7 car and a single wheel lock, if you're not in these nines, you're probably going to lose positions. And you see right there, five pit stops in the nine. But remember, this is the same pit crew that won the pit crew challenge at North Wilkesboro the week before, and that qualified out. Yeah, if you looked at our top two finishers, Christopher Bell and Brad Kislowski, both guys had similar days on pit road, a couple of tens, most everything in the nines. You've got to put everything together to be successful at this level. He had a couple of contenders that came forward. But you see the difference in the beginning. William Byron qualified second. Brad Keselowski qualified 30th. And I was a little concerned about the six car because honestly, even in that little short practice on Saturday, I didn't see a whole lot out of that six car, but it's got to the point now after 14 races, uh, I know the talk has been about the Ford Dark Horse Mustang, but Brad Keselowski and that six group, they're proving that they, you can race this thing. You look at his last six races, four top two finishes, including that win at Darlington. Yeah, definitely putting a bit of pressure on. And now that that win at Darlington is off of his shoulders, I got to think that lets them race a little freer. It's going to be interesting to see how the summer swing goes for these guys. Yeah, they've, they've got speed. It doesn't matter what type of racetrack we go to. They've got good speed in those Mustangs. And, and we talked about the other car here, the 24 car, kind of lost some track position there as we got to nighttime, had a little bit of contact with the wall, was kind of leading the race at that point. Uh, got back, you talked a little bit. We all knew the rain was coming. Rudy, uh, Rudy got on the whip a little bit, let him know he needed to get going, right? Yeah, of all the crew chiefs I was listening to, Rudy Fugel probably was being the most aggressive with telling William, probably 
30, 40 laps before that caution came for the rain that the rain is coming. We need to get all we can get. We need to get all we can on restarts and we need to get all we can any opportunity that comes up on that racetrack. I'd like to say right here, this was a monster move. You kind of get what I did? Right <laughs> I here? got it. So I yeah, it. That, William Byron goes from fifth to third. He gets by Ty Gibbs in the 54, Tyler Reddick in the 45, and one sweep down the front straight away. Again, this was about four to five laps before that caution came out for the rain. And you see this 54, Ty Gibbs gets in the wall a little bit. Tyler is kind of sliding up the hill to him, but really, William, really aggressive here. I'll give Charlotte Motor Speedway credit here because this is turf, and the turf that they had here allowed this move to happen. Got himself two positions off from turn four, the start finish line ultimately put him in a top three finishing position. Well, yeah, their momentum, when they got together off turn four, it just destroyed their momentum, and William Byron had such a head of steam, and I can't imagine what Tyler Reddick was thinking there. It's like, wait a minute, there was no more racetrack over there at the left. Where did he come from? You see it. He almost, when he says inside, there's like a correction back right, like how, how's somebody down there? But a really, really aggressive day here. We talk about it, fast cars and execution. There were some guys that had challenges on pit road. I mean, you're right, Todd. There were a lot of pit stops, but there were a lot of issues going on pit road, and we'll break that all down next. Hey, guys, I'm Corey the Joy, driver of the number seven car. Join my buddy Ryan Flores. Every week, we stack some pennies. Talk about NASCAR Cup Series right out of my windshield. Plus, we'll give out the dogs of the week for the best pit crews and pit crew guys from the weekend. We'll break down all the money stops, all the woes, getting into some technical issues, and we'll also answer all of your hashtag Penny for Your Thoughts questions. And we have a ton of guests. Sometimes SVG pops by, we got Raja, we have all sorts of guys. You never know who's going to pop in the Nonsense Garage, but make sure you tune in. Sirius XM on Tuesdays, YouTube on Wednesdays, wherever you find your podcast on Wednesdays as well. Come stack pennies with us. So Todd, for years, the Coca-Cola 600 has been a race of attrition and Sunday night was no exception, but so many issues on pit road. I, I don't even really know where to start, but why don't we start with listening to some radio with the 11 of Denny Hamlin and the 17 of Chris Buescher. What was that? I don't know. He parked like because he couldn't get in the box, I guess. I don't know. Probably going to have to deal with it all day, unfortunately. He was the very last guy to pick a pit stall and what was left was the one in front of us. I just need to make sure you stop on your sign. I purposely got you backed up, but you slid a little bit far. It hit their changer, caused a penalty, and then obviously you were boxed in as well. So just do the best you can to get around the 24 and get parked on the sign short. Hopefully the 11 will stop short like they said they would stop short earlier in the race. Lambert, I talked to Scott. I, I guess he doesn't get it. The reason the 42 is screwing them is because the 43 is not parking. And so the 42 has no choice but to be parked clear out in God's green earth. The 17 has got to do a better job of parking. 42 is going to screw us all night. Uh, the 11 is going to have to adjust to go farther back because we can't, we can't stand through this all night. As talented as a race car driver as he is, he obviously doesn't get it. He keeps doing it worse. Like, I, it's not the 42's fault. I mean, it's all the 17, 100%. Well, then go over there, Chris. Go talk to him. Brother, if I do anything more than I've already done, we're going to fight. You understand? I've done all I can do. This is a joke. The 42 is not even trying. We're sitting here trying to help the 11 and everybody else. The 42 just keeps jacking us. Todd, Charlotte Motor Speedway is a pretty wide pit road, but the problem kind of starts with some of the shortest pit boxes we go to. They're only 28 feet in length. But then the other issue is the 11 was faster than the 17, the 17 was running faster and in front of the 42, the 42 faster in front of the three, but we had them stacked backwards on pit road and that created an issue all race long. Yeah, it definitely did. Let's, uh, let's dig into it. We've got a, we've got a layout here of, of kind of, this is a pit road cameras and it'll go down through it, but we've got the 11 coming open in. This line back here is actually, that's actually what a full width box width is. So yeah. this isn't quite a full box opening, but it's enough of one. As you watch this and play this forward, the 11's deeper than I think he needs to be knowing the circumstances. Well, and this was the first pit stop, so they should have known right here. There you see Chris Buescher in 17 coming in, running behind the 11, and he's going to have to turn in at an angle. They should have known right now they need to make an adjustment for the next pit stop moving forward. Yeah, definitely. As you watch it, the 17 comes in and tries to get there, and then you watch 
The 42 is coming right, <laughs> as you talked about. The 11 was running ahead of the 17. The 17 is running ahead of the 42. Uh, 17's kind of gotten in the box. These next gen cars, they don't turn very quickly. It's a challenge. It's more of a challenge with these cars than it used to be with the older cars to get the nose turned back out in these pit stalls. Really, if you look at this car, Denny Hamlin's, if he comes back and backs this thing up just inside the box here with his rear tires inside the box, that's a legal pit stop, but that will change the dynamic of this whole piece. The 17 will get more square in his box and we'll see this later. Rolling forward, the 42 and the three coming in here. You notice something here. Yeah, because the three comes in so tight and behind the 42, you're gonna see the jack man have to make a hesitation. He actually goes around the back of the car and the, it even really makes a difference to the tire carrier because he has to hesitate just because of how close the three came in to the 42. Yeah, this is the jack man I've got circled here and he's actually coming around this side at the same time as you look at it, this guy here. He should normally be right out here in this location, but because the three's coming so close to him, he's kind of hesitated as well. That slows down the whole pit stop for, uh, for the 42 as well. It just stacked up all night long, and it really, truly never really got better. Yeah, you look at it, the three gets actually in his box because he's all right. The six is in the box ahead of him. He's already gone. He's going to be able to get out of there. But as we see here, you've got three cars that are all nosed in, the 17, over here nosed in, the 42 had to nose in around the 17, and then the three also nosed in, not making ideal for getting back out of the pit, pit road. It all started though with the 11 behind the 17, how deep he pitted in his pit box, and it just escalated from there. And let's pause this right here, because we saw, and, and I'll, I'll go back, I'll go back forward on this, he's deep. There's more box behind the 11 car than there is in front of the 11 car at this point. He backs up, that's probably where he should be pitted. And, and that's legal because remember the rule, both rear tires have to be inside that back line. The back of the body can be hanging out. So this is the adjustment should, that should have been made by Chris Gabehart and Denny Hamlin after that first episode on the first pit stop. At that point, you can get around the 17 and really, as you see here, the 17 had to back up to come around the 42. I think the 42, uh, he can get out because he has slow stop because his jackman couldn't get around the car. This is the next stop that they come to. This is the 17 coming in without the 11 being there. As you watch this happen. See how shallow he pitted in his box. And I do want to make a point that pit selection is by qualifying. And it was said in that radio transmission, the 17 got the last selection. Remember, he didn't get to qualify because of the practice crash. That's why he had to select where he was. So the box actually was kind of given to him at that point. He was the last one to get a box and put himself in that position. To your point earlier, the, the, the three car was the worst running of these four, position-wise. The 42 was the next. Yes. The 17 was the next, the 11. This is a compound of four positions. And that's on the pit way road. they ran almost all night long. <laughs> it was. And Denny did make an adjustment and stopped a little bit shorter here. That helped the 17 a little bit. But if you look at it, it's just one of those situations where I still think he could be three or four feet shorter and help everybody. It would help the 17 be in a better position. It would help the 42 be in a better position because everybody kind of be backed up and able to get the nose turned around a little better. And that liked to have been big right there. That mm -hmm. liked to have been a two or three car wreck right there on pit road. Really tight to that one. And, and likewise, one more here as you look at it go around, uh, really ended up costing, it ended up costing the 42 position on racetrack, cost the 17 position on racetrack every time they rolled out of here. And, and it cost Denny as well because he's backing up to get around this. In this case, I think the three car ends up beating the 42 and 17 off pit road because of everybody having to back up and check up. Yeah, I like what the 42 did there. That was the better choice, is just stop for a second, let the three go, rather than take the time to back up. You're gonna lose a whole lot more time. There is no question where the 17 finished was not indicative of his performance, but a lot of it had to do with what went on on pit road. Well, executing on Saturday is one piece, but you've got execute on Sunday too. Ty Gibbs won the pole, pit stall won, executed, did everything you need to do on Saturday had a really good pace in their car on Sunday, had some issues. Let's take a look at one of them, a, a slow pit stop. Yeah, a lot of times when you get that number one pit selection, it'll cover up some problems, but it can only cover up so many problems because this right here, you see it's under green and it kind of all starts with that tire that came off the right front. Ended up being a slow stop here. Let's just back that up and, and get back to it. The tire changer in the front sends the tire across. And really, I want to I wanna make the focus here. I feel like, this guy here, 
is actually the cause of the issue. Not that he intends to be, but he's focused on getting that tire out where the tire carrier can put it on the left front. Remember, we're trying to make nine second pit stops. The tire gets in the way of the car tire coming back and that rolls up into the way of the left front. It breaks the momentum and the, the play of the front changer getting to left front. Yeah, this ended up being a 15 and a half second pit stop under green, but yeah, the people across the wall on the other side, they can be just as important as those guys over there changing the tires and jacking the car. You can see it as he comes around here, this carrier or the changer here, when we comes back into view, he's not in his position because he's clearing the tire back out of the way. He should already have the nut off his side of the tire. And, and it really, he's just now getting back to it after he cleared the tire. That's what slowed the stop down. And you can see the left rear is already done. He, had, he didn't even have the right front or the left front off and the left rear changer was completed. And this wasn't the only challenge for the 54 team this weekend. Let's listen to the audio of a later pit stop. Going on the track. Let's have a go on, boys. Five, four, three, two, one, here. Sorry, dude, I didn't, we were taking four there. When I say we're going on the jack, we were not waiting on fuel. Okay, well, then give me a different cheat sheet next time. All I said was not waiting on, not waiting on fuel going on the jack. I didn't say anything else, sorry. All right, I'm just looking at the cheat sheet, and that's what we're doing, so. So, Todd, the problem I hear with that radio transmission, regardless how much experience a driver has, is he knows to, to go on the drop of the jack. You know, if you're going to hold him for fuel, you normally keep the car jacked up. The big thing that I heard there, Chris Gale did not let him know we're doing just rights or we're doing all four tires. Obviously, Todd thought they were going with right sides only. Chris had the intentions of doing all four. Yeah, yeah, definitely a miscommunication there. This is part of that whole code towards piece, that, and it's part of how we race today. We don't want to lay our hand out. We've seen guys get bitten, bitten because that more cars took two than they thought. But you got to have a code word that says this is a standard four tire stop before you tell them we're just going to go on the jack. I understand they're going on a jack because you're not waiting on fuel, right. as, as Chris talked about, but you still have to communicate. We're taking four tires. The driver and the pit crew both have to know how many tires we're changing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, another situation on pit road, Kyle Busch, a really fast race car. Two penalties on pit road. One is an interference call that we haven't seen a whole lot of. You know, the eight car has actually had their share of pit road issues. So you see this box right here. This is a ball and strike call. This is something that NASCAR put on pit road last year and what it tells the driver is you cannot be to the inside of that box if you're going to interfere with another crew's pit stop or maybe even a safety issue. Yeah, there's an orange line that's in the corner of the box. It's kind of an interference zone. So when you've got, when you've got tire carriers coming out here, you've got Jackman, you've got people that have to use this. It's an area of the box that if there's contact, there's, there's, a, there's a ball and strike call exactly. here. As you coordinate this, that, that box that you circled actually lines up with the car width to that orange line on the inside. That's the piece that the pro trailer can see. Yeah, if the 77's not making their pit stop here, it, it, it's a no issue. You, you can kind of do what you want. You just can't drive through more than three pit boxes entering your, your pit box. Right, Kyle could be driving all the way through the yes. 77's, but as you look forward here, he actually makes contact with the tire carrier, and as you see here, you, you highlighted before, that orange box is visible here. The fact that you can, that the pro trailer can see that orange box and the tire contact is, is forward here, as you see, it kind of takes the tire almost out of his hand here. That constitutes an interference call. Yeah, and the good thing for Kyle, this was under caution, it wasn't under green, so the penalty was started the tail end of the longest line for the restart. If you look at this, started, Top 15, I think the first penalty we saw. For the uncontrolled tire. Uncontrolled tire, yeah. that one rolled well forward of that. That dropped him a ton of track, track position. As you look, kind of recovered to this point. This was the penalty we just saw. But the upward trajectory got himself back in the top 10. Good pace in their car, not good execution on pit road. Ultimately, those two pit road penalties were a net of 35 positions he lost. Lost a lap too, which he had to take a waiver on later. That, that, that put him in quite a hole and cost him during the day. 
And it's hard to calculate this stuff, but I would say very possibly the timing of both of those penalties may have cost that eight car some stage points. When you look at where they're at, just above the cut line, every point's pretty valuable to that 18. A tough day for a competitive race. Yeah. Well, you know, there were a couple of other drivers and teams that had to start kind of in a hole, but they had impressive runs going. But when the rain moved in, it cut their day short. We'll talk about that next. I'm Ryan Flores. Join Kim Kuhn and myself each and every week at Around the Track. We'll get you ready for the upcoming race weekends from short tracks to the Cup Series, whether you'll be attending in person or watching from home. Coming your way each week is the best bets to win some easy money and driver suggestions to help pump up your fantasy lineups. Around the Track also tells you what to watch for in the NASCAR Regional Series and which young phenom drivers to keep your eye on. Plus, our At Traction segment gives you all the fan activities, concerts, and tailgating fun at the track. Be sure to check out Around the Track each and every Wednesday on NASCAR's YouTube channel. Todd, why don't we start with Tyler Reddick in that 45 car. No surprise, right from the get-go on Saturday, they had a very fast race car in practice. They went out there and qualified eighth. But why in the world do we see him starting all the way back here at the rear? Well, what happened, they passed inspection on trip number one before practicing qualifying, but they made an adjustment, a very unapproved adjustment to the 45 car. They failed the second time through inspection, finally passed on the third. They lost their car chief. They lost pit selection. They had to start at the rear of the field, and they had to do a pass-through penalty at the drop of the green flag. And I understood right after this pass-through penalty because he joined back up right in front of Ty Gibbs, who was the leader of the race, and he drove away from him. He was at in that, clean air, but he had a fast car. At that point, I knew he had a contending car. He just needed to figure out how to get himself there. Yeah, it, again, and he could run the bottom, he could run the middle, and he could run the top. And where he was Johnny on the spot was on those restarts, Todd. Yeah, if you look at this restart right here after stage one, an impressive jump up there in position. Let's go to let's go to tape of that because it's it's worth taking a look at. And you'll see right here, this is a restart and watch him. He'll move all the way up against the wall, which we know he loves running the wall. But look at, look at, I mean, he is, he looks like he's got about 50 more horsepower than those guys getting that momentum on the top side, coming on the back stretch. He would have got more, but he was boxed in right yeah, there. Yeah, definitely. If it just continues the motion forward, uh, really impressive drive here. He, he did a good job. He went where he could. He, he had a car that had speed in different places, definitely made moves and forward. Drove himself up to fourth. I feel like he would have been one of the contenders if we'd run this race to, to the 600 mile mark. And you talked about him going where other people weren't. Now he's at the bottom of the racetrack. He is taking advantage of wherever that 45 car will let him go because Billy Scott gave him a very good handling race car. Another one that got a really good race car, Cliff Daniels set up, you know, was set for Kyle Larson to come in. Kyle stayed it, ran the Indianapolis 500. Justin Allgaier jumps in the five car hasn't run a lap in that car, hasn't really run a whole right. lot of laps in, in, in cup cars, a great run forward. Two weeks in a row, Cliff Daniels had one driver in the car for practice and qualifying and another driver in the car when the green flag flew on the race. Yeah, yeah, just backwards this time. But, uh, uh, you know, qualified back there, started the race deep in the field, but uh, really impressive run forward to a 13th place finish. What I really feel like Cliff Daniels did, and I think it was by design, and I think it fell right into their lap. I think he knew that Justin needed that car nice and snug. He needed to be tight and secure. And honestly, shortly after that race started, as we closed in on the end of stage one, that racetrack loosened up. And I think that's why the lap times got so good on that five car, because everybody else was starting to trend to the loose side. I want to look back at this area here. Just before we got to the caution there at what, lap 85 or six there, the five car had gone a lap down. Right. And Justin drove his way back to the lead lap, passing the, the, the race leader at that point, his teammate, William Byron. He just got better as the night went on. And I love what he told Cliff Daniels. He said, when Kyle gets in this race car, he's gonna be so fast. <laughs> yeah, he, he really enjoyed that opportunity. and. Drove his way back to the lead lap. That put him in a good position because when the caution came out, he didn't have to take the wave around. Uh, really did some really good things. Uh, a good day for those guys. A 13th place finish. 
with a guy that hadn't turned laps in the car, I think a successful day. Well, the good news is the month of May is behind us and everybody, mo mainly the five car, will be back in normal configuration when we go to St. Louis. It's our third trip to go there to that mile and a quarter track. The two ends are very unique. And I think about the two drivers and teams that won those first two races, Joey Logano two years ago, Kyle Busch in the eight team last year. Lord only knows, both of those drivers need something good to happen. Joey Logano's 30 points below the cut line, and Kyle Busch is just above it. Maybe this is what the doctor ordered headed there to St. Louis. Yeah, definitely a racetrack that's kind of unique. I would have said much like Phoenix, but the aero packages are different. This is in the intermediate aero package, not the short track aero package. Be interesting to see, like you said, two former champions have won the two races we've had here. See how it works out this weekend. So the moral of the story is, even though it's race number 14 of 2024, as far as this year, we don't have a lot of pages in the notebook for going up there to St. Louis, that mile and a quarter racetrack. So St. Louis this weekend, race number 14 of the 2024 season. You can see it at 3.30 Eastern time on FS1. We'll see you at the track.